mornings and welcome to today's 10 minute painting lesson. We're going to begin here today as we generally do with our large damp square headed brush. Here I'm using a mixture of titanium white and primary blue. We're predominantly applying this pigment to the base of our horizon and the reflection of it down in the water as well. Now I'm going to go back to my palette and I'm going to grab more of that same pigment and begin to blend it upwards. The goal here is to render a smooth gradient, one which is very bright down at our horizon, and it should get darker and darker as we move up to the top. So every time we go back to our palette and we grab more paint, we're going to incorporate more of that primary blue and less of the titanium white. Then as we get really close to the top, we'll begin incorporating a bit of Mars black. Now I'm able to blend all of these pigments together so softly here on the canvas because my brush is fairly damp which is adding a little bit of wetness to the paint, and it'll extend the wet life of the paint as well, so you have more time to kind of work with it and render those smooth gradients. On the topic of smooth gradients, if you're finding that you're getting a very streaky aesthetic, I would simply implore you to use a very soft touch with your brush, as this is generally the best way to render a much more smooth application. And when you try to apply a lot of pressure with the brush, you can kind of push paint on either side of it and render an aesthetic which might be a little bit too stark for something this calm like this gradient. So with all of that being said, I'm applying the same gradient down into the water below where we are getting our reflection and I'm slowly blending it all out. If you find that your pigments are beginning to dry a little bit, wet in your brush and then go back into it. Now I'm going to take those darker pigments that we used at the top and I'm going to work in some clouds. I'm doing this near the bottom and I'm allowing it to blend in with our initial application. So here we're getting a real mixture of the lights and the darks. It feels very cohesive because it's still the same colors and it's fairly similar values as well. These clouds are going to make the sky more interesting, but because they are so similar to the sky itself, they're not going to stand out substantially and they'll just kind of be nice accent pieces. Now, I'm also trying to ensure that my clouds are sometimes connecting to one another and that they're always different and evolving. That is imperative when you are working on things like this because you don't want it to look boring. You don't want it to look man-made. It's nature and that means it's always evolving and diverse. So just make sure that you're always trying to figure out new ways to incorporate your clouds, whether it be vertically, horizontally, in different diagonal paths, in different shapes and sizes, whatever comes to mind. Now here I'm using a smaller round-headed brush, some titanium white paint and some primary blue, and I'm working in a second type of cloud. This cloud here is going to be moonlit, so it's going to be much brighter. I'm applying the paint predominantly with a circular application, and then I'm blending it backwards, as you can see right here. I want the edge to be the brightest, and then I want it to slowly dissipate and blend into the rest of the sky as we move backwards. This way, it looks like the light from the moon is hitting the sides here of all of our clouds. And as we get farther back where the light isn't going to be able to penetrate the cloud, it does get darker and darker. So to render a good amount of depth as well as offer some diversity in cloud type here in the painting. Our first cloud set was made predominantly of horizontal lines, whereas the second one was more of a circular application. So just remember that when you're rendering these subjects, there's more than one way to do it, and amalgamating different ways of doing it can generally render a fairly interesting composition and piece. Now here, as you can see, I'm working in the moon and the reflection of it down in the water. I'm doing so with a plethora of different horizontal strokes that kind of all connect in the middle, and I'm trying to ensure that the middle portion of this is the brightest. As we move towards the left and the right hand side of this reflection of light, it should dissipate and it should blend more into the water. This is going to give it a good amount of depth, it's going to give it a nice transition, and it's going to make it look a lot softer. It'll make a lot more sense. 
So this may take a couple of applications, especially if your water is still wet from the initial application that you made. But generally, all it really takes is a couple additions of white in the middle and then a little bit of a blend to either side. So now I'm actually going back into the water and I'm doing so by using the smaller round-headed brush. Here I'm just incorporating the reflection of the moonlit clouds and just the moonlit clouds, which I know might seem strange because we're doing the reflection of one type of cloud and not the other. Why aren't we doing the darker cloud? I felt that if we did that, it would overcomplicate the water, it would make it look a little bit messy, and this is a painting, so we do have the opportunity to take an artistic liberty if we need to, and that just means we alter reality to kind of fit the aesthetic or mood of our painting. If you'd like to incorporate the reflections of the darker clouds, be my guest, you are more than welcome to, it probably should be there. However, I really didn't think it would fit in with this painting, so I did leave it out. I just thought I would give you a little heads up there. But with that being said, I'm now going in and working on the land masses. I'm doing so with the medium-sized square-headed brush, and I'm using this brush because, of course, it does have fairly sharp edges, which are fantastic for rendering subjects that are also a little bit more defined and more so in the foreground like our rocks and our land masses here in the foreground. So, that was a little self-explanatory, wasn't it? But anyways, as we get closer and closer to us in the painting, I'm allowing the subjects to get darker and darker because they're getting farther away from the light. It's also worth noting that we're doing all of these land masses in a blue pigment and not the innate coloring of a green or a brown. Why are we doing this? We're doing that because they are getting so much reflective light from the sky, the water, and everything else. And it's important to recognize that when things are much farther away in paintings and landscapes and pictures, generally the background, the colors, they reflect much more so from the surrounding areas and you get more of that coloring than the actual coloring. So if you really want to instill a lot of depth in your painting, give the foreground more of its natural colors, give the background more of the colors of the sky and the atmosphere itself. Now, from there, I'm actually just continuing to work on the clouds. And I'm going back in with the smaller round-headed brush. I'm adding in some additional highlights to the edge. And I'm slowly just building that up until I get something that I really like. I'm also doing a couple of little horizontal clouds as well, but they're fairly transparent and I am using a good amount of water. I don't want them to be too stark and I don't want them to compete with the moon or the reflection in the water. Then I'm going to take my smaller square-headed brush and separate the land from the water with a couple of very precise movements. Now here I'm also kind of blending that out a little bit and creating that wavy-like effect. I didn't want the reflection to be crystal clear, and I wanted to ensure that it did have a bit of that horizontal stroke that the rest of the water has, just so that it remains cohesive and looks like it's all fairly unified. Then I'm taking that smaller square-headed brush, and I'm working on the palm trees. These are going to be silhouetted, meaning that they are fully in black. This is occurring because it is so far away from the light, and we're just not going to get anything on them at this distance. But the palm trees are all leaning in, and I'm trying to kind of use them to direct the viewer's eye inwards. As you notice, none of them really wave outwards, and that was done intentionally to ensure that they are always moving the viewer's eye into the middle of the painting. It's a little subconscious thing that you can incorporate in your paintings to help ensure that the viewer remains looking where you'd like them to look. Then I'm taking a rake brush, and you can buy these at your craft store like Michael's, but you can also make your own. I made this one by just cutting out little pieces of my brush, so when you make one stroke, you actually make five or six. I do have a tutorial up on my channel if you want to go and find that and you are interested in this technique, but you could do this with a smaller square-headed brush. It just might take a little bit of additional time. With that said, this can actually take some getting used to. 
So if you just get this brush for the first time or you just make it, I'd implore you to try to use it on a separate canvas or a separate piece of paper just to kind of get the hang of it and understand the angles in which it is best utilized. Then I'm switching back over to my smaller square headed brush and I'm working in some highlights to our land. This is going to be areas that are protruding, that are going to be receiving more light, and it's going to add a lot of depth. It's also going to give the land different pathways, which will give the viewer a sense of exploration. Now, I did run out of time, we did go over the 10 minutes, but I did want to show you just a couple more things, and they were predominantly adding more light to our painting, as well as stars. I did so with the smaller round-headed brush, and I think it turned out really, really well. With that being said, that is essentially our 10 to 11-ish minute painting. I truly hope you've enjoyed. If you'd like to learn more, there is a link in the description to my ebook, Acrylics for Beginners. And if you'd like hour-long lessons just like this with the addition of color mixing when I'm using water, all of that, if you subscribe over on my Patreon right now at the $4 level, you receive all of these hour-long plus lessons and a new lesson every month following that. If you subscribe over on Patreon at the $8 level, you receive all of these hour-long lessons and two additional lessons every month following that as well. I'd like to say a big thank you for watching. I post every Saturday. I hope to see you next Saturday. And above all, as always, stay creative.